Hello students, welcome to another tutorial on mechanical properties of matter. In this video, we continue looking at we continue looking at uh, fluids at rest, and in this case, or in this video, we introduce Pascal's principle. Now, what does it state? Well, Pascal states Pascal's principle states that if you have a fluid that is confined, it can be something like this, it can be really any shape, but always saying is if you have a fluid that is confined, so this side it is closed up, and this side it is also closed up, and then inside here what we have is a fluid. Now what Pascal's principle states is as long as this is confined here, and it is confined here, so this fluid is closed up inside. Now, what it states, what his principle states is that the pressure at any point in this fluid is going to be the same. So the pressure, this side, let's say pressure one, is going to be equal to the pressure at any point, even up to this point, pressure two. Now, that's all that we have to, to keep in mind. Pressure one is equal to the pressure two. Now, if you think about what pressure is, pressure itself is just force over area. Now, if you have two sections, like area uh, pressure one, the, the first side, this side on the left, and then the other side on the right, where the cross-sectional areas are different, we see that the equation here then becomes force one over area one will be equal to force two over area two. So this relationship is supposed to hold, provided that this fluid is incompressible, or if we say that, um, yeah, if this fluid is inc incompressible and this system is actually closed. Now, what happens here? What does it really mean? How does it help us? Let's try to answer those few questions. Mm -hmm. Well, what Pascal's principle kind of entails us is that if something changed, if the pressure this side was to change, maybe, maybe the force you apply here, the force F, the cross-sectional area here is A1, this is F, F1. And then here you have a force um, F2, and then this side you have uh, area two. So what Pascal's principle states is that if the force A F1 here was to be changed or the area A1 was maintained, what will happen is that the pressure P1 will change. Why is it changing? Because F1 here has changed. So changing F1 kind of changes the pressure on the left-hand side. But from Pascal's principle, it then tells us to say that what will happen on the right hand side is that the pressure itself as well will change in order to match what happened on the left hand side. So changes in pressure on at any point in this system will change the pressure throughout in the system. So every time this condition will be satisfied, the pressure on the left will be equal to the pressure on the right. So this is what we expect from Pascal's principle. Now, how does this help us? How does this benefit? What are some of the, the key applications? Well, this is used in most cases in uh, uh, hydraulic brakes or garages and so on, just many places in, in, in the industry. How does it work? Let's say you wanted to lift an object to some height. Now, it can be a car, it can just be some piece of junk or something. That would ideally be very heavy for you to lift. But then you want to utilize Pascal's principle to lift it. So what would happen is that the object you want to lift is going to be positioned somewhere there. Now, since this is where the object is, its weight, the weight of the object will act downwards. So the weight of the object will act downwards. So the force F2 here will be equal to the weight of the object W. So meaning that our equation now is W over A2. Now to overcome this force, the weight, or to keep it um, somewhere suspended or to lift this object, what we have to do is, since by putting this object here, the pressure this side has changed. So a change is going to be observed this side. If we wanted to lift this, we would have to exert some pressure F1 on the left-hand side so that it kind of cancels out with what is happening on the right-hand side. To give you guys a clear picture, uh, think about it like this. If let's say on the 
on the right hand side, the cross-sectional area is A2 is equal to, can, can, let's, for simplicity, let's use uh, simple values. So A2 is obviously greater than A1 from our diagram. So let's say A2 is 10 centimeters, uh, centimeters squared. Well, A1 is equal to five centimeters squared. Now, if the object we apply on the, um, on the right hand side is, let's say, of, of magnitude of weight, um, 1,000 uh, newtons. Uh, let's, let's not use centimeter square, let's use meter squared. Okay, so this is uh, the meter squared. We can even say this is one meter squared, yeah? And then this side we have 10 meter squared. So what force must you apply on, or on the smaller cylinder in order to balance out or to cancel out this, uh, this, this weight, to support that weight. So what we notice is that if we use Pascal's principle, the force F1 we need to apply on this cross-section area one will be equal to 1,000 divided by 10 meters squared. So we see that F1 we have to apply, it's actually just 100 Newtons. So when you look at this, when you look at this value, or if you compare this value to actually the weight that we had of F2 of that object, we only need a small value, a small force on the smaller cylinder to support or to, yeah, to support a, a heavier object on the, on the larger, on the larger cross-sectional area. So, that's, that's the main benefit. A small force can be used to overcome a large, a large weight. That's the main application of Pascal's principle. Now let's look at, um, at, at a larger question, a question I left you guys with in the, in the other video so, so that we see exactly how problems come and how to approach them using this idea. So if you guys haven't had time to go through the question, you can pause the, the video right away and try out uh, this question. Yeah, try to, to work it out, attempt it. Yeah, it uses basically the same ideas that, that we just used uh, in the previous section uh, with that simple example that I gave you. Okay, so in a, in a car lift used in a service station, compressed air is a, um, compressed air exerts a force on a small piston of circular cross-sectional area, cross-section having a radius R1. So they're telling us to say that R1 is the smaller one and this is given as the radius is 5.00 centimeters. And then this pressure is transmitted by an incompressible liquid to a second piston of radius. So the other piston now, the larger one, clearly even when you see the, the, the radius, you conclude right away to say this is the larger piston, radius 15 centimeters. What force must the compressed air exert on the small piston in order to lift the car. So in other words, we want to find the force that must be exerted on the smaller piston in order to lift a car this side. Now, what is the weight of the car that we have to overcome? So the force F2, as I pointed out earlier, is equivalent to the weight of the object we want to overcome. Or the force F2 is the one actually that goes to the car that we want to lift. So in other words, it has to, to balance out with that, that value. The two are equal, the force F2 and the weight we're trying to, to lift. In this case, the weight we want to lift is 13,300 Newton. Okay. Now, with that in mind, uh, if you want, you can quickly sketch our system again. You just want to have a clear picture again of what is happening. So this side, this is where we have our larger uh, larger piston and then we want to support our car let's say that's our object the object we want to support and then the other side we have a smaller piston okay now since we have pressure here due to the to, yeah we have pressure at this side we also have pressure this side this pressure of obviously is the one that is going to be balanced out by the force that, that is going to be applied here. So 
the pressure is exerted on the piston here, yeah? but then it's going to be balanced out by the force that we are applying here, F1. This is the force that we want to find. It's going to be equivalent to the force that the air inside this exerts on the cylinder. The question is phrased such that they are asking for the force that the compressed air exerts on the smaller cylinder. But what this force is actually equal to, it's the same as the force that you'd have to apply on the smaller cylinder in order to support that, that car on the other side. These, these, these fluids are at rest, so there's no motion. We expect that this car is stationary and the force here that we are applying F1 is actually balancing it all up. Okay, that's why we're saying the force F1 here is actually equivalent to the force that the compressed air inside exerts on the smaller cylinder. Now this side, of course, we have area one, and on the right side, we have area two. So the weight of this, of this object is the one that goes out as F2. Now, how do we work it out? From um, Pascal's principle, we have F1 over A1 is equal to F2 over A2. Now, of course, from here, uh, we want to find what F1 is. So this becomes F1 is equal to A1 over A2 times F2. So that's the only thing that we have to work out now. So first thing is first, A1 is equal to pi R1 squared. A2 is equal to pi R2 squared. So if we make this substitution, this becomes F1 is equal to pi R1 squared over pi R2 squared multiplying F2. So from here, you can make the substitution and work it out, or you can cancel the, the pi since it is common throughout. This is just R1 over R2, and then both these are squared multiplying F2. So what is R1? The question gives gives R1 as, um, as five centimeters. So notice that here, I'm kind of not really worried about the units because it's the same unit in the numerator. It's the same unit in the denominator. So if I did this, I know the units will cancel without affecting my force here. So I hope you guys are able to follow that. So what happens here, it's five, this becomes one over three squared, multiplying our force. Our force is 13,300 newtons. Okay, and if you work this one out, you should be able to get F1 as 1,477 point seven seven eight newtons but then want to work in um, to three significant figures so this becomes 1480 newtons or in scientific notation you can write this as 1.48 by 10 to the power three newtons so either is okay you can write leave it in that form or you can uh, write it in scientific notation Okay, so the second part of the question, uh, what is it asking us to find? Is this everything? Let's go back to the question. Okay, so what force must, must the compressed air exert on the small piston in order to lift the car weighing that? So we found that force that must be, that must be, must be exerted on the, on the piston. But then what's the next part? The next part now they're asking to say, what air pressure will, will produce a force of that magnitude? So now that we have uh, the force that is acting on the piston, what air pressure will actually, uh, will actually produce this force? So what we have to remember is that force is equal to, not force, pressure, so we have to remember the definition of pressure. Pressure is equals to force over area. So we've just seen what the force is. Now, what they're asking for is what pressure of air will actually produce the force of that magnitude. And remember, this is on the smaller cylinder. So our A is equal to uh, pi R1 squared. 
So just remember, in this case, since you now the force and the area are going to interact, you kind of now want to keep that, uh, that radius to the right, uh, the right unit. I mean, how do we do that? The force we have found, it's 1.48 by 10 to the power three newtons. And the cross-sectional area, if we convert the radius first, if we convert the radius first to, to meters, it is initially five centimeters. So this becomes 0 0.05 meters. And then if we use it there, this becomes A is equals to pi multiplying 0 0.05, but this has to be squared. We bring it in our formula. This becomes 1.48 multiplying 10 to the power three divided by cross-sectional area for, for A1. You can even write this as A1 since it's for that side, the smaller cylinder. So this becomes pi multiplying 0 0.05 squared okay so you can simplify this but it should be able to give you 1.88 by 10 to the power of 5 pascals okay so um i hope you guys were able to follow through how to how to work this one out this is the last part of the question so i hope you guys were able to to get it right okay so as always you can always um uh, leave your reactions in the comment section. Let me hear how you found this video. Is there something that you want me to go through uh, one more time? I, have you understood the concept of Pascal's principle and how to apply it to work out question? If not, I can find another question that I can uh, demonstrate how to use the same principle to, yeah, to, to work out that particular problem. If you have, let me hear it. Uh, if you have understood, of course, let me hear it in the comment section. And if the video was helpful to you, then leave a like. Yeah, otherwise in the next video, I'm going to work out the question I left um, some time back. So this is uh, uh, this is for a composite a composite wire. I left it some time back for you guys to try out. After getting um, a lot of requests for me to work out this question, I'm going to finally make a video over it. So I hope you guys um, actually tried it out. Yeah, a couple of you were able to get it right. A couple of you struggled. So I'm going to see exactly what tips you're supposed to use. But ideally, the key concepts to working out this lie in the fact that the total change in the in the length of the whole wire must be it must be given by the smaller contribution. Since here we have the wire is made up of copper and steel, so this is going to be the the extension due to copper plus the extension due to due to steel. We're going to see exactly how this idea is used to work out this question. But of course, now that I've showed you that this is the method I'm going to use, you can try it out. Get the expression for change in L in terms of the Young modulus and uh, the initial length of copper, the, the cross-sectional area of copper and the force acting on copper. It's going to be the same force on steel, uh, the same cross-sectional area since this is uniform diameter, Young modulus of steel this side. And then of course, the change in L is the total change in L for the material, which is 0.7 millimeter. Try to use that and see if you're able to work it out. But otherwise, I'll be back next time with a full video on how to work out this problem. Otherwise, um, hope you found it helpful. Uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. This was your tutor.